you know, the, the powerful are afraid of social media. And I think you could go back to the, the Dreyfus affair and see something similar happening where the uh, intelligence agencies and the military, um, they were terrified of the public intellectuals. And uh, Emil Zola was uh, the, the novelist was famous for his, uh, his newspaper editorial, J'accuse, right? And uh, that really uh, transformed uh, the movement in favor of Dreyfus. Um, but that was a new thing. You know, public intellectuals didn't have that much uh, influence. Dreyfus uh, was a free man after 12 years of struggle, uh, which, by the way, is uh, the same number of years that um, Julian Assange well, was detained, you know, I think 2012 to this year. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking to two colleagues who are actually with me here in Japan. We've got Dennis Riches, who's a lecturer and researcher at Tokyo's Seijo University, and Johan Edebo, who works as an associate professor in philosophy at Sweden's Uppsala University, but currently spends a year on sabbatical over here. The two of them recently wrote a highly interesting piece in which they introduce a phenomenon they call bell epochism that explains why some of the social tendencies we see today are so reminiscent of the attitudes of the late 19th century. This is what we want to discuss today, so welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thanks. Dennis Johan, you coined this phrase, bell epochism, and first I thought you're just making up a word because it's always good to make up a word as an academic, but then I realized when reading the piece that no, 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 you're actually hitting on something here. And something that I haven't heard, but something that rang with me, because you're you're saying that the late nineteenth century is has a similar mindset from what we are seeing right now. Could you explain bell epochism a little bit more? Maybe we start with Johan and then and then Dennis. What's the point about this? Mm -hmm. So the, the concept, the concept is, is Dennis one. Uh, he he coined it, and I'm not going to take credit for that, but. We're, we're converging on the same idea here, I think. And, and let me maybe maybe start at the, the wrong end a little bit, but just to get us on track. So, so a point that I and Dennis are making in uh, an upcoming paper we're working on, it sort of converges with, with what you are describing here, is, is that the, the culture of, of the West, very broadly speaking, and not least its political culture, it has become progressively less diverse and more monolithically aligned with uh, the institutional interests, with the, the power structure of the society, so we say. And, and this is not to, to deny the fact of, of polarization. It's rather something that probably explains a lot of the political polarization we see. It's, it's a very complex topic, this all in all, which, which touches on many kinds of, of fact and many many scholarly disciplines and many potential theories, but the, the main observation I think we're focusing on here, you, you might disagree on some aspect of it, Dennis, but the main observation I think is that there is this clear ideological and political integration of not least the ruling uh, strata of the West, uh, like how the, the elites and their institutions are circling the, the wagons in a sense, uh, of, of various Western polities and how this gets mirrored in the ideological narrowing of, of the public discourse of the, the public political landscape. And it's also mirrored in the political integration of the public and how it tends to identify with the dominant power structure. I, I think that is at least somewhere here is the connection between the political uh, landscape and cultural landscape of the two eras. Uh, let's, would you, uh, maybe let's take that apart, Dennis. Why is this kind of social structure, which I think we're seeing at the moment, I mean, we're seeing across the collective West uh, an, an unprecedented form of integration. That's something that's going on, right? What you were talking mm -hmm. about. Dennis, why is that reminiscent of the late 19th century? And what's the period that you're thinking about politically? Okay, yeah, well, first, I'll just say I agree with uh, what Johan said there. 
And uh, I also want to mention that the, if anybody's interested in seeing the article, it's published on uh, Propaganda in Focus uh, online journal and uh, on my blog as well. Um, I'll link it but, down below. Okay. But uh, anyway, uh, I guess I'll go back to uh, just the sources that uh, sort of in, gave me the idea for this paper. And uh, I was focused on uh, the late 19th century. Um, I've got a background in studying French language and literature and history. And uh, so I've always been interested in that period uh, that uh, started with the fall of the, the Paris Commune and the end of the Franco-Prussian War. And uh, it just occurred to me that uh, a lot of the cultural products we uh, consume today, a lot of the film, uh, novels, uh, biographies about famous people, fascination with uh, famous events like the Titanic mm -hmm. and uh, the onset of World War I and the, the, uh, the creation of the Federal Reserve in the United States. Um, that all happened in that period from 1870 to 1918. And so, uh, and the Belle Epoque was said to, to end at the outbreak of World War I. And uh, so for some of the sources I was reading uh, uh, and uh, that I put into this paper were, for example, uh, Adam Hochschild's uh, King Leopold's Ghost about the Belgian Congo. Um, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, I read that long ago um, uh, when, I was a, when I was a high school student. Um, and uh, uh, Jean-Denis Bredin's History of the Dreyfus Affair. Uh, Mark Twain, writing about the Gilded Age and uh, uh, in the 1890s becoming a critic of, the, uh, of America, uh, the Great Republic turning into an empire. And uh, there was also um, um, an interview that Chris Hedges did with uh, a Proust scholar named uh, Justin Smith. And... Uh, that got me thinking too about what it's like to see uh, the end of the Belle Epoque, okay, and the end of a, an era which you thought was wonderful, and especially for Proust, who was uh, who was entering old age at this time when World War One broke out. So for him, it was just this um, sort of tragic. Uh, I guess the, the scales falling from his eyes, you know, and the and this horrible. Uh, feeling of losing a world that he knew. And so um, when, a, when a period like this ends, it's, uh, it's very different for a person who's 60 years old uh, as opposed to somebody who's you know, 20 years old and doesn't have the memories of this period that uh, preceded it. And, um, and, and so I think, uh, yeah, there's, there's an echo now uh, between uh, our present uh, Belle Epoque, and we look back on the old original Belle Epoque to, to reinforce uh, our belief about okay, the period we're living in. And we take some reinsurance and comfort the, in uh, watching those stories. The thing about the Belle Epoque is, of course, that it was Belle, so beautiful, the beautiful epoch. Mm -hmm. It was only beautiful for a certain segment of the globe, right? It was mm -hmm. really only beautiful for North America and a couple of, of uh, Europeans, and even there only with a certain segment, because you still had the whole working class that was still basically shut out of all the social uh, higher stratas of, of society, right? And the entire colonized world that was just mm. like legitimately as you wrote about the congo in a horrible state but for these few people it was an international uh, conglomerate of elites right and back in that in those days we had the first great world exhibition in london right we had a lot of international events we had the first japan boom around 1905, uh, Madama yes. Butterfly and, you know, the, the enthusiasm about Japan winning over Russia in that, in the, in the, the war, that was the first Japan boom. And we see, we see things like that at the moment. Again, Dennis, do you think that the, the, the psychological, because you write about this psychology, um, what this, what, what this world view of Bella epochism does to people, do you think that currently we again see um, psychological traits that we can already find back in the 19th century. Uh, yeah, I think those segments of the article were written by Johan, so I'll let him take that question. Okay, Johan, please. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a complex question, I guess, but it's it's really really interesting that that you raise these aspects of the 
of the the sort of emergence of this uh, this cultural cohesion and this this worldview of of the late 1850s because as you say this is like the apex of european colonial dominance you have the significant uh, optimism at, at least among the, the the governing classes of society and and the important important media and, and the emergence of, of propaganda uh, propaganda institutions also reflect this this very optimistic outlook and you have significant technological expansion and, and innovation and also i think significantly the the penetration of scientific materialism and, and a secular worldview which not least is, is reflected in the the great exhibitions which are predicated upon this this new narrative of, of progress that, that that will sort of guide us towards a utopia and, and raise the race the the impoverished classes and the uncivilized societies to, to new heights that that's kind of the dominant social imaginary and whether or not we i mean there are significant differences of course in relation to our own period it's, it's not just like a, a mirror image or a or a, or a reflection in that sense but you can argue i think that the the late the late decades of uh, the 19th century are, are relevantly similar uh, in terms of this mindset because then you have you have the F fukuyama's notion of the the end of history you have the idea that capitalism and liberal democracy have emerged victorious uh, the evil soviet empire has been defeated and there's the general notion that there are no classes anymore and now there's just progress and infinite progress towards utopia awaiting us and, and this is kind of the same sentiment you saw emerging in, in the late 1800s which was then suppressed due to the, the social realities of the early 20th century but then emerged again in the, in the post post-war period and i would say that if you have a dominant worldview of this kind i think it's it's to expect that certain psychological traits among the population will emerge as an effect yeah at least and uh, the psychological effects you then is you're saying you can you can trace them in the films or in, in popular culture that we are seeing right um, and we did we did have also these movies like the the greatest showman and and so on and we have other movies that go a little bit further back like what was that weird tv series uh, uh about aristocrats on netflix aristocrats like uh, who's dating mm -hmm. who what was that the that was hugely popular as well um but I'm not familiar with it so. but it, it's always the story of like a, a good world where like externalities don't matter uh, mm -hmm. only only what happens between these characters who walk around in beautiful costumes that's the only thing that matters <laughs> is that a trait of belle epochism or not dennis yeah i think so and also it's it, there's the shock when uh, so people realize that there are things going on outside and they they enter in uh, in surprising ways and uh, grab people's attention uh, and I think the uh, the great example from the uh, the first Belle Epoque is the Dreyfus affair. You know, a little uh, scandal involving uh, somebody who was uh, accused of espionage and convicted of espionage um, in France. You wouldn't think it would be a big you know, national scandal that could bring down governments and and so on, but uh, it did. And then it became a social phenomenon too, where um, people uh, took sides of it uh, very with very strong passions and friendships broke up, families broke up as they, they took either sides of it. And I think that's very reminiscent of uh, the Trump derangement syndrome mm. that we see now that started in 2016. It seemed to come out of nowhere, you know, it was unexpected uh, and it's left people in a, a state of shock. <laughs> so the, the argument is that we are at the end of the Belle Epoque, right? We are, we are, we are headed towards the ultimate the ultimate climax, which then for the Belle Epoque was the First World War or the yeah. Great War, as it was called at the time. Um, yeah, I would say even there's an echo of it uh, exactly from uh, 1914 to uh, uh, 2014, you know, when uh, the Obama presidency started its project in Ukraine. And then shortly after that, uh, Trump started running for president. Uh, so um, 
you know, almost exactly a century apart uh, that these events happened. And the, the thing is that also before the, the First World War, a lot of people said, this is dangerous. What we are doing is dangerous. The, the building of these alliances, the underlying currents that were going on, the the people were building against this, right? We had two huge peace conferences in 1899 and 1907, and those were not done uh, those were not done out of of, of um, utopianism. They were done because uh, especially a couple of people, and we have to credit Tsar Nicholas, who, mm. who who had the idea for those to say like we need disarmament. <laughs> These, these were disarmament conferences, first and foremost, that, that completely failed. But they, uh, the, the awareness that these arms are there and they might lead to, to, uh, to calamity was, was present, wasn't it? Um, uh, Johan, what do you think would be the parallel to this today? I mean, we understand that we are in a very dangerous situation, don't we? Mm, that's not really my field. And I, I'm sort of at a loss to to give a, a reasonable answer to that question if, if we really have any any sort of parallels in, in that regard in, in this current situation i guess you could could map it in relation to the so-called third world and the the attempts to to sort of mitigate the conflict we see initiated not least by by leaders in, in the so-called third world that there could be a connection there but i'm i'm thinking in terms of the uh, to, to just backtrack a little bit here, I'm thinking that th there should be an argument that an, an increasing political and cultural consolidation would generate uh, polarization in the in, in the sense that that w when you lose nuance in in the in the political culture. It, it, you quickly get a situation where those who, who stray from the dominant narratives or those who, who, who seek reforms or what have you will quickly be regarded as, as orthodox. And, and the situation today, I guess, is that you are dangerously unorthodox if you stray from, from the, the sort of, of uh, established narratives. And, and uh, do you think... I was just wanted, wanted to ask you, Dennis, if you think there's a parallel to this polarization that emerges in connection to the Dreyfus affair in France in this context, or, or is that too much of a stretch? Yeah, well, I think um, a polarization was there, uh, be, not in the Dreyfus affair so much, but in the uh, the Russophobia that existed even back then. Um, uh, people in Western Europe thought they had... Uh, invented liberal democracy and it was going very well uh, but russia was still uh, a monarchy and an empire you know an autocracy and so there was an awful lot of uh, um, you know just a real uh, uh, hatred and suspicion of russia and uh, in fact joseph conrad who whose novels i love but uh, uh, he was he was polish and uh, he'd taken up british citizenship and become a famous author writing in english but if you read what he wrote about the Russians, um, mm. you know, he hated Solzhenitsyn and uh, the Russian writers. And he did, there was just basically nothing he liked about Russian culture. Uh, he didn't like uh, the Tsar and he didn't like the Bolsheviks, um, didn't trust them at all. So um, that was very deep seated uh, already back then. How, how is it, though, that even within the Belle Epoque, we seem we seem to find this this schizophrenia that on the one hand, yes, Russia is an outcast because backward. Mm. On, on the, at the same time, Great Britain was also a monarchy. Okay, it was a constitutional monarchy, but they're very proud of that, and this carried forward. That's something that I never understood. Why is it that when we talk in in the Asian context about the evil Japanese empire, the empire went, you know, around, the empire took things. But when we talk about the empire in the European context, everybody is like, oh yeah, that was a good, that, that, that was a good time. <laughs> and, and that was already there in the, in the 19th and early 20th century, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And there were also, a, a, I wouldn't want to paint it as just like a monolithic culture where everybody just loved uh, the bourgeoisie. And uh, there were a lot of critics and uh, there was a lot of upheaval going on. And uh, one person we wrote about in the article was uh, Edmund Denny Morel and his his mm -hmm. uh, campaign against the Belgian Congo. Uh, within Britain, he pressured uh, British politicians and had a massive uh, campaign going on, uh, 
they had, you know, monthly uh, newsletters going out to thousands of British citizens who wrote to their members of parliament, uh, became international. Uh, Mark Twain took it up and uh, it eventually, uh, you know, got into the British parliament and they passed resolutions and pressured Belgium. And finally, in 1809, uh, Leopold lost his enterprise and uh, Belgium nationalized it and turned it into just an ordinary empire. But there were great contradictions in all of this because um, Britain, France, uh, and Germany, they had their colonies in Africa, and they, they weren't quite as horrible as, as King Leopold's Congo, but uh, they certainly were committing their abuses. And, and uh, those contradictions you know, came to the surface and yeah. came back to haunt Europe uh, in World War I when they, they demonized each other. <clears throat> Johan, how do you think that, um, or let me put it this way, um, you, you put a specific time frame, right? I think if I remember correctly, you're saying like the 1870s until 1914 kind of mirror the 1970s <laughs> until uh, 2014. Mm -hmm. um, uh, why, why these two? Um, as, why not the end of the Cold War? Why not mm -hmm. 1989, uh, 1989 to 2014, which to us uh, it's like was a very peaceful time in Europe, extremely peaceful, extremely uh, 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 kind to grow up in, right? With a lot mm -hmm. of like just calm and stability and new and new gadgets every day as, as kids and as, as adolescents, this was a very pleasant time. And um, why the longer period? Mm. Yeah, that's, I guess that's a bit of a conjecture. And, and there's an argument that the, the parallels are more obvious in relation to the well, to the, the period after the end of the Cold War and, and, and so on. But I think there's also uh, this notion that, that uh, at least what I'm, what I'm grasping for here is that the, the, you see an erosion of, of popular resistance, uh, of the, the energy and power of popular reform and resistance movements, which sort of is rooted in the, the cultural... Uh, upheavals of the 50s and 60s and, and in my view this this process of uh, left left-wing radicalism towards uh, the reform and, and uh, revolution and, and uh, restructuring of society it sort of ends in in the late year last years of the 20th century you know with the wto eu and ng8 protests and and so you have from from the 50s and 60s or maybe early 70s uh, a period of uh, well the the sort of power or, or energy of these reform movements ebb out and finally end during this around the year of 2000 i think after which the the war on terror and, and the associated propaganda apparatus really catalyzes this, this consolidation of, of the cultural space which is again not not this monolithic phenomenon, but uh, of sort of that the the mainstream culture becomes much more politically and ideologically consolidated. And, and just to to connect with what Dennis said uh, previously, I I think you see a similar structure in the in the culture of the the original Belle Epoque, uh, the, the late the late nineteenth century not as a monolithic phenomenon, but how culture and, and the, you have these dynamic political movements of the, of the like mid 1800s, right? And at the end of the period, you, you see for the first time how they really seem to crystallize into tools of the social hierarchy. Uh, Robert Mitchell writes in his um, famous book, uh, it's translated to something like, like political parties from, from 1911, how, how oligarchy seems to be a tendency of, of complex uh, organizations and th this observation seems to be accompanied by how culture for the first time in this period becomes this is mass produced consumer product serving the purpose of reproducing ideology in, in, in the Marxist sense of the term and this is also mirrored in how how mass culture really it turns out uh, really is restructured to, to serving the same purpose in the period 
probably between the, the, the war in Vietnam towards the end of the, the last years of the 20th century, when, when the process is kind of completed and, and popular culture becomes so strongly and, and, and uh, is so strongly ideologized or, or politically uh, monolithic. You, you, does that make sense to you? It does make sense. It does make sense. And I'm especially interested in this, um, in this aspect, the propaganda aspect and the abuse of popular culture in order to uh, entrench the power elites further and further, because I think that's something that we see right now. And you published this piece in, a, in, a, in an outlet called Propaganda in Focus. Uh, Dennis, um, can, you, can you make a few more parallels with, um, you know, the entrenchment of, what should we call that, uh, 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 like cultural tropes that then become like power structure supportive that, that you can see? Uh, yeah, but for that, I'll just go back and mention, uh, I think 18, or 1970 is a good place to start with this era because uh, there was a French anthropologist, I forget his name right now, but he predicted the end of the Soviet Union in uh, 1975. And you can see uh, that's when the neocons in America uh, uh, during the the Carter presidency start, started planning the, the neocon project, the neoliberal project. And I think there was an understanding in Washington at that time that, that the, the USSR was weakening and it was going to be over soon. Um, so, and that's exactly what happened through the 80s. Uh, so, and also, uh, Belle Epoque also means a, a massive uh, technological changes. Uh, if you go back to the original one, there was just so many. Uh, changes coming in electricity, photography, um, modern medicine and medical techniques and so on. And then in the 1970s, you got the, uh, the information technology revolution, which uh, lasted, uh, you know, up until the early 21st century. Um, but uh, to speak of a, a reinforcement, uh, I, I see it in the cultural products and the movies uh, where, you know, every... You know the, the stories about uh, the old bourgeoisie or the, the uh, from the, the the original Belle Epoque were all based on you know somebody's daughter has to get married uh, and find a, a suitable uh, uh, mem uh, husband in the in the right social class and so on or or somebody's in crisis and they're in danger of falling uh, through the cracks you know like a uh, typical example is Titanic where you you have that. Uh, that love triangle going on, and uh, and uh, the the young girl's mother is more concerned about her getting married to the rich guy than than the girl is, and so on. And uh, I think you see that reproduced in in the modern films and stories as well. And the uh, the status quo never really gets questioned anymore. And if there's a crisis in some uh, upper middle class family, um, that's the story. And we see the crisis being resolved. And at the end, everything goes back to normal afterwards. So, yeah, now you can, you can argue that that is a, is an, um, is a symptom of Belle Epochism. You could also argue that it is just an eternal, uh, it's eternal stories. Love is eternal, therefore it keeps coming up again and again. Intrigues are eternal, therefore they keep coming up again and again. Um, but I, I do think that it is unquestionable that um, some cultural products um, support certain structures more. I mean, we know the influence of Hollywood and we know that Hollywood is explicitly also being supported and used by US mm -hmm. military apparatus to, you know, if you want to get access to one of their planes in order to film, you need to um, run the script through them. We know all of that. And we've got tons of this. Um, what is it? The... the uh, that uh, that fighter jet movie with Tom Cruise. Oh um, yeah, Top Gun. Top Gun, of course. And then um, Lady Gaga making a song about it. And, you know, the glorification, the constant glorification of the military. And that's something that's also very classic, right? The military was, mm -hmm. like, we find tons and tons of old literature in which the military is always the top brass of society mm -hmm. <laughs> and the heroes. Um, does that also play into into your bellapokism? Maybe you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think these are important points you're making. I, I think there's a sense in which the, the content of of the narratives of the 
symbolically important narratives and the situation ha have clear and, and distinct effects. But I also think we, we need to think about the structure of cultural uh, culture consumption and production, the, the relations of production in terms of culture. So, I mean, you, you during this period between the, I'm not exactly sure which decade I would place the start, but between the 1870s and, and, and the First World War, you see modern mass society really emerging for the first time. And the function and meaning of culture also changes to, to reflect this transformation, which in turn, I think, has immense downstream political effects. And, and I think the art, the content of the art at the end of the period also clearly reflects this, this process, because on, on the one hand, it's as, as you just described it, it's increasingly superficial. It's geared towards consumption. It celebrates the, the lifestyles and priorities of the upper class. But on the, the other hand, if you look at uh, the content of novels like Sigrid Unset or like Edvard Munch's uh, the, the Scream, those kinds of, of products, it deals with alienation, with existential despair, and with the, 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 the emptiness of an increasingly regimented and stratified industrial society. So you have these contradictions emerging from the fact that culture, the meaning and, and function and role of culture changes because not least of the technological developments. And one important political aspect to all this, uh, I think relates to the, 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 the limited space for, for popular intention. Uh, a friend of mine, John Stepling, lamented the, the loss of theater uh, from, from the, the social arena. And a point of his here was that when, when popular intentionality in the culture is reduced, which is like theater is the, this intercourse of, of agents and their unique experiences in the social arena. But when this gets diminished, popular political influence will also lose ground as a function of it. And I think this is what we're seeing both in our period and, and in the original Belly Poke due to the technological transformations, not least. Dennis, where and where do you see the parallels? Um, now, first, I should just mention, uh, yeah, uh, John Stepling's uh, podcast. Uh, Johan and I have both been on there recently. Uh, it's called Aesthetic Resistance. It's on Substack, so I just wanted to give a plug for that. Um, but um, in parallels, I think when I think about uh, modern entertainment and movies, uh, I see very few stories about the working class. And uh, yeah. most of the uh, the entertainment is um, sort of aspirational. I think if you're um, if you're not middle class or upper class, you can at least watch these stories and think May maybe someday I will, you know, or, or and you can easily understand yourself or put yourself in the position of a of a privileged person uh, going through some kind of challenge or crisis society, and that seems to be what uh, uh, the stories were about. A uh, hundred years ago, and even now, that's the product of Hollywood. Uh, but there are some exceptions. Uh, I think uh, True Detective in uh, season one, uh, which uh, came out in 2014, actually, is, is a rare example where uh, it was really focused on the underclass and uh, the victims of crime and so on, and, and without uh, uh, being, uh, you know, what they call propaganda, you know. You know, propaganda that just makes the police forces look like uh, heroic. So, so, would you say like that folk culture is is being pushed aside? Because I I would say that like from the '30s to the '70s, I'm not an expert, but then then you would have a much more distinct representation of of the so lower lower strata of society and and of the, the sort of folk and popular cultural products. Would you both agree on on that? simple observation yeah i think so and we've talked about that on on uh, aesthetic resistance mm -hmm. podcast a lot about how the uh, the films in the 1930s and 40s uh were made by european uh, uh immigrants oh, yeah, yeah. and working class people who uh, were able to uh, write their scripts and get their films produced without a lot of interference you know, from the studios and uh, so that was the whole noir genre which uh which are you know today the classics that maybe people love them if they go back and watch them. 
maybe two questions like uh, to both of you um the do you think that the emergence of social media changes something in this equation or not or do we have like a parallel back in the 19th century uh, because like one thing is that when we look at when we watch netflix and so on you know the produced shows what we find often is exactly this kind of uh, let's let's sympathize with the upper class, even in home renovation uh, uh, series, you know, you usually go to the big houses, the beautiful mansions and so on. You have a lot of this. Of, and so uh, on the produced side and on, on the social media side in YouTube and, and so on, you also have like a tiny house movement, you know, people and people who share t uh, tips and tricks of how to hack your life, you know, how to make everyday life a bit easier. And that also has a very popular space, right? Um, second question, we can do them differently, but before I forget, the role of uh, the apocalypse. Because mm -hmm. we had, especially around the 2010s, a lot mm. of apocalypse movies mm. coming out. Zombies on the one hand, but also you know the, the movie 2012. There's a lot of end of, of history or end of civilization kind of doom and gloom movies, um, which of feeds also into again the military with like uh, Independence Day and stuff like that that was produced a little bit earlier. But it's still the fear of of the end of his of the end of, of civilization. Um we can treat them separately, maybe maybe first social media and then uh, uh, doom and gloom. Um, let's start with Dennis. Um, yeah, like everybody now, uh, you know, the, the powerful are afraid of social media. And I think you could go back to the, the Dreyfus affair and see something similar happening where the uh, intelligence agencies and the military, um, they were terrified of the public intellectuals. And, uh, and Neil Zola was uh, the, the novelist was famous for his uh, his newspaper editorial Jacques, right, and uh, that really uh, transformed uh, the movement in favor of Dreyfus. Um, but that was a new thing. You know, public intellectuals didn't have that much uh, influence uh, over uh, over politics at that time. And also, if you if you see the films made about uh, the Dreyfus affair or read the books, you notice that the the intelligence officials and the military. Uh, they were also terrified of the parliament, this new system mm -hmm. of governments. And there was a lot of diversity in the political parties and their stances. And uh, they knew that if uh, the party they didn't like uh, got the majority in parliament, uh, things were going to go very badly for them. And uh, they were embarrassed. And, uh, but they, unlike today, they didn't resort to uh, murder and disappearances and extra legal activities. So, uh, they kind of followed the law and went along with it. And um, Dreyfus uh, was a free man after 12 years of struggle, uh, which, by the way, is uh, the same number of years that um, Julian Assange mm -hmm. was detained, you know, I think 2012 to this year. History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Mm -hmm. um, Johan, do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, let me just try to, to say something on this matter, but because I think it's a it's an excellent observation, and I think there is a clear parallel to to between the early early development, early emergence of, of mass culture proper, and it, digital and social media in the late twentieth century. Because as, as you as you observed, Dennis, I think this was really a period of, of flux and of, of like political, not instability, but of, of political diversity, political and cultural diversity to begin with. And you hadn't really consolidated properly these these new forms of uh, of media like the newspaper and the telegraph and this kind of thing. They, they were not really consolidated as a tool for tool of power it had other ends it was potentially politically destabilizing from the point of view of the governing elite it, it had a radical potential so to speak and, and this was also very much the case with uh, the early internet i would say especially during the, the 90s period where it was almost entirely decentralized this is a complex complex discussion and, and it's by no means like this is simple to to draw political conclusions from it but at least during that period in spite of its like hierarchical structure and its origins in the military it seems like the, the internet and the digital infrastructure had a, a really significant political potential in terms of, of uh, 
popular democratic influence. So the structure was like this, like that of the, the, the BBS, the bulletin board systems from the 1980s, where you had all of these small nodes everywhere and no overarching structure to, to navigate or streamline them. So, so you, you could exchange messages pretty much freely all over the, the web. Uh, you played games and you listened to music, of course, but all of that was either pirated content and much of what you, you read and, and consumed, so to speak, was actually generated by other users. So there was kind of this, this democratic cultural aspect to it. And now, you know, you know, remember something like ICQ Messenger or, or the, the MSN Messenger? It was like, like a system for direct messages. You, you connected by an email account and, and then you sent direct messages. But now something like that would, would basically be, be put on trial, you know, like the, the Telegram founder and, the, and the, the, the legal affairs around that situation. For, and he, he's basically, he's guilty of providing the same communications infrastructure that we all had back in the 90s and when we used with, with no, you know, without issue, which is a significant, I think it, it clearly reflects how this potentially destabilizing structure of communications needs to be consolidated from the perspective of, of the, the the social order, the power structure of society. And so I think there are important parallels here. And I think that consolidation is what happened during the, the, the late 19th century towards the, the beginning of the First World War. Right. Okay, thank you. And maybe the this issue of the apocalypse, Dennis, you see the apocalypse reflected also in the, in the literature and art of the 19th century. Um, no, I don't think there was any consciousness of, of the world ending and our man having an impact on, on the, the nature so much. And uh, one of the, uh, H uh, there's an HBO series called The Age of Innocence, uh, which uh, takes place in America during the Gilded Age, which was the American term for the Belle Epoque. And uh, I think innocence is a key word because uh, we we we're fascinated by those stories from that era because uh, I, think, I think one maybe unconscious reason is that uh, those people uh, hadn't seen World War I, World War II, uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear terror, or ecological you know, catastrophe on a large scale. They couldn't imagine it. So it's nice to go back and, and live in that time and stories from those days. Yeah. But what we're going through now is, is maybe, it's a, it's a new experience for the human race to, to contemplate uh, that it could, uh, mm. could put an end to life on earth. Or... <clears throat> so we do see these different kinds of stories and uh, uh, people like to be terrified. So they, they make great material for stories. <laughs> is it? Is it... Is it maybe rather something that's older than the than the Belle Epoque? You know, the I'm thinking of the medieval ages, where in Europe the idea of the end and Judgment Day was extremely important, and maybe also mm -hmm. in in like uh, pure uh, American Puritanism and so on, uh, where the idea that Jesus is going to come back and then we are all going to be judged and the world as we know it will end. I think there it is important, but maybe that was something that the Belle Epoque actually didn't consider very much, did it, Johan? I so so this is a I'm not sure if it actually considered it very much, as you say, right? Uh, but uh, like apocalypticism as as a social imaginary is like, it's a fixture of of Western cultural history, and it goes way way back, of course, to to the the beginning of Christianity, not so much to other religions, I would say, and. I think it's an interesting observation that yeah, it's it was it's been a part of our history for for two thousand years, especially with with like a peak during the Middle Ages, I think, in relation to certain social transformations that occurred. And I think it also there was a there was sort of a peak in uh, in the fundamentalist movements in the nineteenth century, especially in, in the United States. So if if you're looking for apocalypticism. During the Belle Epoque, you will find them in the U.S. Uh, and this was also kind of a, it's a response to secularization and uh, and these uh, these processes of, uh, of 
historical criticism of the Bible, of Darwinism and all that. So, so these movements are in a sense a uh, response to this, this uh, social development. But uh, I think it's an interesting observation that we have we have seen less of apoc the apocalyptic imaginaries than I, I expected. So, you know, as you say, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the, we, we, this culture was rife with, with these, these narratives. And I think, I think it began uh, around, uh, you know, when, when the financial crisis of 07, 08 came to pass, I think that sort of catalyzed a lot of these narratives. But I would expect I would have expected to see more of them from my personal point of view. Uh, so maybe the case is like that they are too close to home right now. They they are they describe the situation a little too clearly for for people to be really comfortable experimenting and thinking about them. That might be the case why they fall, fell out of favor. The other one also fell out of favor, and and maybe this goes in what you're saying. Like we are beyond the point where fear is marketable because we are nearing a very a very dangerous point and if we i mean the the amazing thing is that we saw the also the collapse of anti-war movies anti-war yeah. movies are not popular right now <laughs> they used to be yeah. in the 70s 80s 90s and we had anti-war movements in the belle époque with um berta von what's her name um I forgot her name, the big anti-war anti activist, you know, the, the early days of, of, of um, big anti-war social, so, social societies. The International Peace Bureau goes back to the pre-First World War period in Sweden. Yeah, and all the, all the leftist movements. Lots of the leftist uh, movements, and they were anti-war. And these anti-war yeah. movements, together with the anti-war uh, anti movies, they have they, they're gone for the last 10 years, and especially for the, since the last two or three years, they're gone. Are we gearing up to the moment when we again gonna have, just like in the First World War, everybody cheering that it's finally war. <laughs> if you look at London, Paris, uh, Berlin, like everybody was cheering, finally something's happening. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the danger of a social calamity, like a world war, um, maybe Dennis. Yeah, well, uh, I mentioned Edmund Morel and his uh, his campaign against the Belgian Congo, and uh, he was a well-respected uh, hero in Britain during those years. Uh, but uh, just before World War One broke out, he started to to talk about the uh, the danger of the um, the secret Entente, you know, between France and Britain, and he was warning people that it was going to be a catastrophe. And then when war broke out, he became a critic of the war. And he was completely, you know, isolated and ostracized in society. And uh, Bertrand Russell uh, supported him, a couple of people, but um, but he couldn't. He was running for parliament at the time, and he couldn't do that anymore. Um, I think he was in prison too for a short time during that. Yeah, he was held, he was accused of uh, sending anti-war material to neutral countries, you know, neutrality studies, therefore, and. Um, uh, so he did a short stint in prison. And after the war, uh, I think he was elected as a labor member of parliament. But um, but the isolation and desolation he felt uh, uh, was very similar to, uh, I think, what anti-war activists are feeling these days or uh, what people experienced uh, if they uh, didn't agree with some of the um, coronavirus policies uh, and vaccine policies put out by countries. It was just, it was just a shocking level of... Uh, uh, hatred and exclusion uh, aimed at, at those people. And stifling of dissent. You mm -hmm. cannot dissent. And if you do, you're an outcast at best and imprisoned at worst. Um, Johan, do you have observations on this? Mm -hmm. I, um, I think that's, a, that's an unnerving observation on, on your part. I, I really did not see it as clearly before, uh, before you, you put it out like that. Because I, I think it's, it's obviously true that, that the political and cultural consolidation has pushed us further towards a point where we're, well, you know, the, the descent is, is increasingly difficult. Uh, it's probably, you, you can probably explain that as a factor of political and, and cultural consolidation. So if you, if you, for instance, were to suggest that, that we, we ought not maybe to, to join NATO or to further further escalate the situation in the conflict with Russia, our conflict with Russia, 
then you're you're not only you're not within the realm of, of polite political discourse anymore. You you are veering towards the realm of the traitor almost, and and that's a hugely dangerous political uh, atmosphere, I think. But also, as you say. I recognize this observation that there might be a, a sort of longing for the, 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 the war. There's a longing for the, the release of the conflict at, at some deep psychological level, perhaps. Because when I read discussions in, in forums and Facebook threads and what have you, I constantly encounter this, this sentiment, this very sentiment that you describe here, that we describe here, this sort of is reminiscent of, of uh, like Hitler's uh, rhetoric in terms of uh, let's just kick down the door of the Soviet Union and, and the House of Cards will just collapse in, on itself. There's a there's a desire to sort of foment this war and, and get it get it on track already, and there's a there's a very strong belief in, in the superiority of the West and the, the invulnerability of the West, which is, is not very far from the sentiment of, of uh, the nationalistic sentiment you saw all across the board before World War I. So yeah, that, that's kind of unnerving, I think. It is, because it's this sentiment that then transpires into general society. And I'm not so much afraid of a, certain, a, a couple of looney tunes in politics. I'm afraid yeah. of the masses. When the masses start drinking the coolie, then, then we have a problem. And then all you need is, is a guy who says, do you want total war? Or do you want to liberate Ukraine <laughs> and beat the Russians? And then the masses will go like, hooray! And at the end of the day, you need the people in the, with the guns who run towards the bullets. Um, I will never forget that conversation that I had. This is on a side note with a Japanese um, 20 years ago, who at the time he was 80 and he fought in Okinawa. And obviously he survived. And I asked him, what's the secret for surviving a war like that? And he told me, you always run with the bullets, never against the bullets. I thought that's a very, <laughs> it's a very smart observation. Um, but we are fostering this right now, this this heroism to run toward the bullets if necessary, don't we? Interesting. If I could go back to uh, one more thing about uh, the apocalyptic films and so on, uh, I think uh, you could notice too that there was a long series of movies about pandemics uh, uh -huh. uh, in the early part of this century. Um, and then when uh, when 2020 came, um, I looked around. I was thinking, I wonder what Doctor House would say about you know the the situation and how they portray it. And and of course, Doctor House was long gone. That show was over. But uh, there were no other medical dramas, you know, of significance popularity at that time. And curiously, they just disappeared. Huh. And if if there's one that comes back, um, I don't know how they're going to portray those years. You know that they may just uh, use the series as a propaganda tool uh, to to show one point of it, but um, you know the patients walking into a hospital and the clinic are going to have very divided opinions about this. Yeah, so I don't know how they could uh, have a modern uh, TV drama that honestly depicts uh, what people were really fighting about in those days. Yeah, social think... criticism is gone. Yeah. So you think they finally killed off Coronation Street? Is that it? This long-running British TV medical drama, it's been, I think it's been since the 60s. I'm not familiar with that one. All right, yeah, it's, it's pretty yeah. famous. I, I just want to also to mention, I have a, a friend and colleague uh, at Lund University of Sweden. Um, they've just started a five-year project on uh, the end of the world. It's called a transdisciplinary approach to the apocalyptic imaginary in the past and present. So they, they try to dig a bit deeply into these issues you just um, uh, requested perspectives on. And the lead researcher is uh, Jane Svennungsson. She used to be in the, the Swedish Academy. So check that out if, if you're interested. It could be, could be worth your while. Thank you very much. I will, because I do think we need to, to study more of these uh, and also discuss on podcasts like this, the uh, historical parallels. There are some things that just fall through the cracks. One of one of the things that would be very interesting would be a project. Uh, I would like to call it 1885. And the project is, let's depict the lifespan of people who live 100 years 
in one city across the globe, you know, let's take 20, and they live from 1885 to 1985. And then we depict what, what they went through, how the world around them evolved, because we have examples of people who might never, who never moved once, but their nationalities would change twice or thrice. <laughs> because, especially in Central Europe, you know, imagine you were born in somewhere in, 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 in um, the Balkans in 1885. Imagine how, how, your, how your nationality would have changed without your house having like changed even once. Um, Interesting perspectives. Yeah. Place like Trieste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then Bosnia Herzegovina. Yeah. yeah, eighteen eighty-five was the uh, the year of the Berlin Conference yeah. that uh, started the the colonization of Africa. Mm -hmm. It's um okay. Um, my colleagues, thank you very much. This was a very it was a bit of a different talk than what I usually do, but I find it highly interesting and fascinating. Um, people who want to follow you, where can they find you? Uh. I have I have a blog, uh, uh, just my name, Dennis Riches, with a period between the first and last name at uh, WordPress, and I also have a Substack. Okay, I'll put that so. into the description as well. Mm -hmm. And 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 you, Johan? Well, I, I also have a Substack. It's called Shadowrunners.substack.com, I think. Shadowrunners. Yeah. And and watch uh, the Aesthetic Resistance podcast on Substack. Yeah. Aesthetic Resistance. Okay, everybody, this will be in the in the descriptions. Um, Johan and Dennis, thank you very much for your yeah. time today. Well, thank you very much for having us. And uh, uh, it's uh, it's really kind of uh, humbling to be here with all the uh, illustrious people you've had on your your uh, YouTube channel. And uh, you've had a great success with it. And I hope it continues. Thank you. It's all about sharing ideas. Thank you, guys. See you soon. Take care. See you. Yeah.